Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert! The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. I think I'd like to encourage us to keep going because Agile um, and all of these modern ways of working, um, they are a multi-decade, maybe a hundred year change. Maybe it's gonna take that long to really shift into the ability to respond to our environment versus trying to control it. And so I wanna encourage us that we're doing the good work and we need to just keep going. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> oh, let me shut down so I think last time, things. I don't know if you remember, last time I saw you was in uh, Dublin or in that yeah. Ireland conference. And yeah. uh, it's crazy how time flies by. And uh, mm-hmm. it's. Uh, yeah, that is last time we saw each other. So that was 2019. Is that right? Uh, I think I want to say it's even like 20, 18, maybe 2018. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. Yep. And we're still here. So let's be grateful. <laughs> I know. I know. It's, uh, it's been in this, like, I, I don't know if you knew, but like I grew up during the civil war in Bosnia. So like everything that's been going on in Ukraine mm-hmm. brings a lot of memories because we went through similar stuff and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's sad. It's sad to see what's going on, but yeah. Yeah, and I'm sorry you're having to live with that burden on top of everything else. Yeah. Well, it's it's uh, I look at it as a positive and like it, there's a lot of positive that came out of that. Uh, the fact that we live actually now in the United States and that, uh, mm-hmm. you know, so. But that's uh, I want to write a book at, at one point about just my experience during the war and just in general, like just I think a lot of that uh, is lost as the time goes on. So. Um, Yeah, it is lost. And we, you know, it just reminds me, we don't know what people are carrying with them. And especially these Mm. days when there is so much um, upheaval and turbulence. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I can, and you know what happens too is like you you forget things like, um, you know, like living without water, like going two miles to just get drinking water, like, you know, not being able to take a shower, like we would have to, like without, uh, <laughs> we would have to drag, you know, get water, like, you know, to, to take showers and like living without electricity, food. My dad was like in three different concentration camps. So it's like, you know, and all of that, like, you know, it's, it's crazy. It's like 27 years fly by, or, uh, you know, almost 30. And like the thing is it feels like it was another life and that's what's yeah. strange about it it's like well you know it happened but like you get it's so easy to get used to good life i guess and uh, <laughs> you for, no i'm serious like you know i talked to my relatives back in bosnia and for them it's different like but when you, you when you have a normal life and you, you know you don't um you don't care about those basic human needs um mm-hmm. then it's i think it's easier to forget i don't know but that might be something for a different well i think <laughs> i think it's actually um i mean since it's on your heart and in your mind it probably yeah. is something to help that, that you could help people understand what's going on in a more human level yeah. you know yeah i mean just the story of walking a very long time just to get drinking water yeah well you know, as a kid the, that's the other thing it's like as a kid it was all fun like no school it was like awesome like you know we would mm-hmm. go to school for two weeks then they would say no you know like there's bombardments and all of this like you know don't <laughs> and like mm-hmm. as a kid you didn't uh you 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 saw it as a, as a fun thing more than you didn't see the real side of the war i guess yeah as much yeah, as yeah. uh so, you know, I just want to acknowledge that we are in incredibly turbulent times, and yeah. this is the place that we are, I, my, my, uh, my spiritual leaders in my life keep saying, Lisa, you were born for this time because you're here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh yeah, great, thanks. Thanks for that. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I do find it challenging. Uh-huh. And uh, so as we like, as we move into this podcast together, 
um, it would help me to align with your greatest intention um, mm -hmm. to understand a little bit about what your high dream is for the podcast itself. And you know, I'm just really curious about the Agile to Agility name as well. And I imagine that that's related. Yeah. So sure. So the, I started writing a book uh, now three maybe years ago um, called Wicked Leadership. Uh, based on wicked problems and how do we deal with complex problems. It was also based on um, how to look at wicked leadership through uh, integral lens or the mm. four. Uh, and I got stuck with pandemic. I got out of my rhythm and all of that. Uh, so I made an excuse. I was like, okay, I'll start a podcast. And I think it was born out of that, like, oh, I'm stuck, but I still want to talk to people. I still want to validate some of this stuff. Um, and it was another reason was like, I didn't uh, see anybody doing anything similar. Uh, I think Agile Uprising was the probably the only podcast. And I, I actually learned about it afterwards. Um, and I was like, I just want to talk to these people. And I think also bring um, some of these thoughts that are not well no, like maybe to to the people's attention, and uh, I was pre pleasantly surprised. People seem to enjoy it or uh, like what you know the guests I bring on. So that was uh, that's the intention. So it was born out of kind of almost procrastination uh, of uh, of just not willing to or not willing to, but not just finding the rhythm to go back and write. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I really appreciate what you did there, which is to find another way, mm -hmm. you know, rather than getting completely stuck, which is so easy to happen when writing a book. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. it's uh, what I realized is like when you start writing, uh, you have to be in a rhythm. And then when I was like writing every day, even a little bit, or just editing. But as soon as you stop, at least for me, yeah. it was uh, it was difficult to get back. So it actually is a job, you know, like Elizabeth Gilbert, who's one of is a famous author for her um, autobiographical books. Eat, Love, Pray is one is one most people know her for. She talks about that her job is to show up at the desk every morning and write and that, you know, she she counts on these sort of these geniuses showing mm -hmm. up in, in the form of these creative beings you know, to make it good. But her job mm -hmm. is to get up and write. And there is something to that that I don't think a lot of people think about when they're like, oh, gosh, they wrote a book. They must have been so inspired the whole time. And not, not really. You just make yourself get up and, <laughs> and write. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, yes, certainly sometimes. But it's actually just a discipline, too. It is. It, that's what I found out uh, that it really, it does. Uh, uh, I guess it's different for different people, but for me, it was definitely yeah. getting the rhythm and, uh, and doing that. So, uh, so yeah, I'm still kind of debating. I'm still uh, rewriting or trying to dive into it, but uh, uh, I haven't fully like yeah. gotten back on it. So I keep doing the podcast, I guess. Maybe I'll have to stop or figure out yeah. how do I prioritize. I guess it's not a priority. If it was a priority, I would do it. Uh, I feel like I still have things that are marinating in my head that I want to say, and uh, uh, maybe I'm not ready to put it down on paper. Well, I mean, I like the idea that you're testing your ideas, Yeah. you know, and you're finding out what resonates and yeah and what i've done also is written like i would uh, publish like part of the chapter on linkedin or medium and get feedback and you know see how it resonates with people and that's been really helpful too um so i've been sending people ch chapters to uh, uh read i just uh sent to lisa crispin and she's been <laughs> apparently enjoying it and she's uh been giving me some feedback so uh, good good yeah. well your book is needed um Leadership is the great new bottleneck, I suppose. Yeah. So maybe let's uh, let's uh, you know switch it up a little bit. Uh, uh, I want to ask you uh, from your perspective, who's Lisa Atkins, and what's been your journey uh, to where you are today? I think you know a lot of people know who you are and uh, know of your work, but uh, could you maybe share with us like your journey and maybe some of the things that people may not know? about you yeah i sure can um it's uh it's interesting to think about it from a different angle and what's coming to mind right now to share is that um according to the gallup's strengths finder 
my two top strengths are connectedness and futuristic. And so that's probably something a lot of people don't know about me is how much I actually live in the future. It's very hard for me to bring myself to the present moment. Mm -hmm. Constantly thinking about what I'm going to do next. What, what is it going to be like in 10 years, 20 years, 100 years? Mm -hmm. You know, what's it going to be like when we don't have jobs, which is actually predicted to happen within 100 years, that we won't even have jobs anymore? Like, so, mm -hmm. like, how does the human need to evolve in order to be a good match for a world with no jobs? For example, so these are the types of things that occupy my mind, and um, the whole movement about agile coaching was really because I was so motivated by the pain and the lack and the tamping down of people's potential that I saw in corporations, mm -hmm. and I thought, oh, these agile coaches, these are the like these are the new change agents. Agile is genuinely a new thing it's not in the same pattern it's literally a new thing a new a broke the mold it's a mm -hmm. new mold and it has the possibility of bringing in um, a human way of working that also is just rigorously transparent and honest about what's going on so i, I was attracted to all of that mm -hmm. and i i could see i could see that the ways we had been trained to think about business were no longer true mm -hmm. but that we kept believing they were and we still do to a large extent believe that they're true things like organizations being mechanistic for example mm -hmm. an idea we tend to believe even though in most cases that's actually not true anymore so um i'm constantly thinking about like what is what is the thing that's going to I think will happen. Mm -hmm. And my second question is always, you know, given the incredible privilege I have had to have the teachers I've encountered and the experiences I've had and to be born at this particular time in this particular place, you know, what is my responsibility? You know, where's the place for me to serve? So mm -hmm. what's going to happen and where do I serve? Those are always my questions. Great. So maybe like that, that's, uh, that, that, that's related to another question I want to ask you, which is like, what motivates you? What pulls you forward? What keeps you going? It's going to sound strange, but what motivates yeah. me is pain. Yeah. You know, I often get the feedback that the way I articulate my vision or mission in the world or my purpose in the world is just mm -hmm. too much of a downer. <laughs> 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 so, so sometimes, I mean, there are ways to turn, you know, anything that's a sort of a downer into something like the, the state of what you want. Mm -hmm. And I can do that easily. I can shift the language to what I want. But sure. in the background, what's constantly motivating me is that I just think this human life is too precious to be wasted in suffering. Mm -hmm. It is. And I think it's, it's easy just to kind of like, you know, um, kind of mold into it, fit into it, and just like, you know, um, not question, like, you know, but it is, it is, if you think about it, it it's it's pretty short, it flies by um, very quickly. I mean, you know, at the beginning of this podcast, we started talking about, you know, just my journey, and uh, I'm the same age that, you know, my parents were when we came to the United States, and that doesn't feel like it's been that long ago, but <laughs> they're grandparents now, so um Time's flying by and like we have a choice of, you know, what type of life we want to live. And a lot of times we just kind of go with the flow. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because life is long and short. I mean, there are certainly yeah. times when it feels long, mm -hmm. like when you're in a dead end job or you're compromising mm -hmm. your integrity to yeah. feed your children. And that, you know, that's a, a honorable thing to do, but mm -hmm. it can make for a very long life um, in a way that's not um, enjoyable. You know? Yeah, and you know we're we're at the a crux in human history where we get to ask the question, you know, what would have me be fulfilled, and to find a way for that to come true, and that's brand new. And obviously, it's not for everyone on the planet. Not everyone gets to do that, but more yeah. and more people are getting to do that. It is, and I think people at least are feeling that they have more choice and. Uh, uh, I don't know. I think even I, with the whole like COVID and being remote, I think people are realizing that a lot more can be done and that you do have uh, options at least to, to get stuff done from wherever you want, rather than being stuck somewhere that, you, you know, you're just doing it because, you know, it pays the bills. 
Um, so I think that that's something that definitely talking about future and talking about, you know, maybe next 10, 15 years, I think uh, it's going to be uh, very interesting. And I've been enjoying like the fact that I can go and visit family in Europe and, and train from there or go to Mexico and have some, you know, good time with friends, do some work as well. And, uh, and, and just, uh, you know, I have, op- I feel like I have options. Right. When I worked inside organizations, um, it, it, you felt constrained and limited. And uh, that, I think, limits your creativity, limits a lot of things. So it'll be interesting to see how and what gets, uh, you know, uh, uh, I guess, the, you know, uh, uh, what rises out of out of the challenges that we've seen through through COVID. Uh, but maybe just to come back a little bit more to your journey, what do you, and then talking about, you know, <laughs> shifts and forks in, in life, what do you think, what were some of the kind of biggest events in your life that shaped your journey? I mean, the, one of the biggest events was just encountering Agile. Mm-hmm. And what was that? The, like, what was that experience? Like, oh, how? it was horrible. I hated it at first. <laughs> I, ha- I hated it and loved it at first. I mean, it was, it was a real, it was a real mixed bag of emotions because I could see how, how glorious it is because mm. no one has to tell anyone what to do. People can work together and people can actually produce real things, even in the midst of great complexity, you know, even in the midst of not knowing exactly how this thing's going to turn out at the end, we can see that the next piece we need to build is going to be this piece that mm-hmm. in itself has value. And so that is, that's amazing. And that so corresponds with the rapid and now even exponential pace of change. So I could see how it was so much better, but I hated it because it created an identity crisis for me. Mm-hmm. I had to completely shift the way that I thought I was providing value. And I thought that I was valuable Mm-hmm. You know, if you want to get right down into the core of it, you know, uh, so Agile challenged that, um, you know, really directly. And I, uh, I see that in, in the leadership teams and in the, with the leaders that I work with now, mm-hmm. they're at the top of organizations. They brought Agile into their organization for various reasons. Now it's becoming abundantly clear that the way they're leading is creating impediments. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really hard to face Mm -hmm. it is i mean it's 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 i think it's it it is that identity it is like you know uh this is who i am this is what people know me as uh i can't change who i am and it's that uh that thing that we cling to uh that's the most dangerous thing rather than letting go of our identity for instance uh and saying you know uh that's not necessarily who i am and I want to, you know, uh, grow maybe past that, whatever it is, or see things from a different perspective, at least. I think maybe even just letting go of your identity for, for a second as a thought and saying, what will happen, <laughs> what will happen if, if I didn't cling to, to who I am um, <clears throat> without, you know, give me any insight. So um, I do want to come back. They're just going to like expire. They're just going to yeah. disappear, you know, immediately. Yeah, which is not true. I mean, we're like, we're incredibly flexible and we are way bigger than we give ourselves credit for usually. Yeah. I want to dive into that topic a little bit deeper, but maybe first couple of fun questions just to, okay. uh, <laughs> because I do want to talk about consciousness. I do want to talk about um, some of the ideas around, you know, adult development, but, um, and, and leadership that's tied to that, obviously, but um I, I, I was thinking as far as like what would be fun questions to ask you and uh, one that I came up with it, it was if you had the influence and wealth of somebody famous like Elton, uh, Elon Musk or uh, somebody, you know, how would you use it if you had a lot of wealth and influence? How would you use that right now, I guess? Or Yeah, I, I don't know that I'd be doing anything different than Elon Musk is doing. I mean, Elon Musk yeah. doesn't talk. I, I actually have not listened to him talk very much, so I don't know if he says, if he talks about the sort of dire situation we're in on the planet. Yeah. He may or may not talk about it, but he is certainly making moves to alleviate or at least help um, us deal with the dire situation. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually have a Tesla. I love it. It's not a car. 
It is absolutely yeah. not a car. It is a n completely new kind of vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I can see that uh, his idea of us getting off fossil fuel and, and the way that the organization works from a customer's perspective, and mm -hmm. I'll tell you a quick little story about that, is it's absolutely in line with the mission of, of getting off fossil fuel and us having um, the chance of uh, a brighter future as humanity. Mm -hmm. So the, what, you know, we're in the Tesla dealer and, you know, the Tesla comes white with regular wheels, right? Mm -hmm. My husband couldn't stand the regular wheels. Okay. So we're going to pay a thousand dollars to get the upgraded wheels. Okay. That's fine. So we're doing that. Um, and then I wanted it to be blue. I love that <laughs> sapphire blue color. <laughs> And so I said, okay, well, if he's going to get the wheels, then I'm going to upgrade it and get blue. And the guy said to me, um, what I love about Tesla is there aren't salespeople. They're all engineers. And they just, uh. they just geek out over the tech. <laughs> the guy said to me, so you can do that. It's totally your prerogative. And we charge you, I think it was $2,000. We charge you $2,000 to, to change the color. And here's why. It requires hmm. us to stop the line and then do just blue cars for a little while and then go back to white cars. And our job is to get as many Teslas on the road because for every Tesla we get on the road, we take a gas vehicle off the road. Mm -hmm. He says, so you can have your blue car, but it means that our production will be down. And he had some like incredibly precise number. Like he looked up something and said, our production will be down by 2,350 cars that month if you mm -hmm. have your blue car. And I said, white's good. <laughs> uh. white, and I love my white car. No problem with that. So here's so here is how it's not just, you know, how much money can we make in selling cars, mm -hmm. but how can we really live out this mission of getting gas cars off the road and getting electric cars on the road, mm -hmm. you know, to the point of involving the customer in what most businesses would never expose. Exactly. You know, and so ultimately, it's your decision amazing. as a customer, right? And, and they yeah. just all they all they they create a transparency and they align the transparency with their vision and and what they're trying to do and yeah purpose. Yeah. yeah. So there's a there's a model called wealth dynamics that a guy named Roger Hamilton has created, and at the very very top of this model of wealth dynamics are people who are called composers. Mm -hmm. And Elon Musk is a composer. Um, the very, very top is called Legend. He might already be that too. He's definitely the richest man in the world. <laughs> yeah. As we speak, you know, he just bought nine point some percent of Twitter and that t tipped him way over. Anyway, uh -huh. um, composers create the new piece of music or the new composition that we are all living in. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have the wherewithal to be a composer. I know I would never be able to think of things as Elon Musk does. And to be fair, he's super weird too, right? So very few people yeah. can actually follow his mind, mm -hmm. but, but, he, but he, he is able to create a new composition for us to live in. Mm -hmm. And I think that's amazing. And I'm, I'm very grateful that we have some helpers on the planet right now like that. Yeah. Um... In what ways, I guess, maybe to go back to the influence and well, what, how you, you know, how you would use it. I mean, you've done a lot for the agile community. I think, you know, uh, defining what agile coaches and coming out with agile coach competency uh, framework. And uh, 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 in what, what other ways do you, you know, you, I think, you know, something that I spoke with you or we emailed back and forth, but just, you uh, Maybe to 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 touch to to talk about it uh, the the bringing in how much you've done over the last couple of years for women in agile and uh, some of that work. Could you maybe talk about that and like you using your influence? I remember I asked you uh, like maybe to speak at the conference someday, and like you're like Milan, this is what I'm trying to do right now. It doesn't align. I would love to do it, but I'm trying to focus. And I respected that. I really did. And I you know. Uh, we all have, you know, a lot of stuff on our plates and uh, 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 we prioritize things. So uh, 
could you maybe talk about you know just how much and what you're doing with uh, women in agile and other yeah. Yeah. yeah sure so what you're referring to i think is when you contacted me to speak at a conference and um i responded with so i, I kind of like the tesla people did just created some transparency <laughs> you know yeah. you know i said so here's the deal i've realized that i'm speaking way too much at conferences mm -hmm. and that um and that I only speak now for free at women in agile events. Mm -hmm. And and other than that, my standard corporate rate is X and my community discounted rate is Y. And mm -hmm. if there's a budget for that, we can talk. Um, because you know, I like a lot of people want to give back to the agile community that has given so much to me. Mm -hmm. You know, the people were incredibly generous with their time and their and their discoveries and what they were learning and it had totally accelerated my path and so I, I focus yeah. a lot on giving back that way and of course then at some point it was just especially with the pandemic when everything went instantly online it was yeah. just like way too overwhelming I realized um, in 2021 I spoke at 43 events <laughs> So, that's so obviously true. a different business decision needed to be made for 2022. And that's what you were mm -hmm. the recipient of was that business decision. <laughs> I think that's what you said or something like, you're the first person that, that I'm yeah. actually doing this with. <laughs> exactly, uh, so, exactly, uh, exactly. Uh, yeah, so it's just a little bit about, you know, where, where to spend time and where to spend that influence. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, for me, I'm, I'm really focused on helping people who can themselves be influencers mm -hmm. clear the things that hold them back mm -hmm. you know, that's my work with leadership teams right now and it's also my work with women in agile i'm going to be doing an event here in the next day or so called mm -hmm. um increasing your influence and impact in the agile world through the 10 mm -hmm. women strong organization so that will be um you know just some really nice gentle probably fairly intense work with a small group of women um, for them to like just get real about what is holding them back from having the impact they want in our world. And so um, I think it's important. I think it's super important to, to champion the emergence of more indifferent voices. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And I think that's where innovation happens. That's where a lot of good stuff happens. So like if you can in any way uh amplify that or support that i think that's awesome um what's uh what's one thing or what what's some of the things that you've recently learned about that you're excited i'm researching exponential change and how humans are not yet geared for it right now okay. um, i'm okay. also researching and learning about collapse all the various ways that our society will likely experience a significant collapse or cascade of collapses. Mm -hmm. um, and so those things are like not necessarily happy things, but mm -hmm. I feel like it's important for me to take on that information and to include it in all of my thinking about, you know, where, what do I do next? Where do I help? What do I offer to the world? Mm -hmm. um, Anything and, that stands out, like maybe that's excited or that, that you, you're worried about that you're learning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm super worried. I'm super worried about where we're headed mm -hmm. as, a, as a human species. There's no doubt about it that that, that is a background level of worry. I also mm -hmm. believe that probably most people are worried about it, but unconsciously. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I've just brought that to my conscious process because i think right now my job is to expand myself and my leaderfulness to be able to integrate that incredibly um dire information mm -hmm. and then still be able to lead mm -hmm. in fact yeah, even someone, leading from yeah. a broken heart even leading from a place of despair mm -hmm. Yeah, which is like the the it's almost like the more that you know and the more the 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 more that you see the complexity of the world and everything, <laughs> the more challenging it becomes to how do you lead and you know the it, it, it's 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 definitely interesting. Um, at least I know from my perspective, the more that I know or see, uh, the more 
uh, that it's it's harder to make sense of things in a sense. We all make sense, but it's also harder to to uh, you, you start seeing just the you know interwineness of things and and just uh, that there's not just one right way or that there's not just one single truth or things like that and. Uh, it, it creates uh, high levels of complexity just to, you know, uh, it's how we. Um, and it can create the, despair and paralysis too. You yeah. know? So like one of the things that ha is gonna happen this year at Agile 2022 actually, is that I am uh, the moderator of a panel called uh, around Agile's bigger role for our planetary level challenges. Mm -hmm. And I'll be having on that panel people who are doing experiments and asking the question, you know, how can Agile be applied to poverty or sex trafficking or climate change or mm -hmm. uh, wicked problems and what people outside of the Agile community are already doing related to wicked problems. And so I'm hoping to instigate a worldwide conversation about, you know, what is Agile's role for these very daunting, as you say, complex, interconnected topics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, I mean, like, we can't separate the work from life or from, you know, environment. So, like, it's how do we integrate this stuff rather than just think of the separate things that exist, you know, in silos. Um, anything else? I mean, what else are you learning that you're kind of excited about or worried about? Well, I'm learning about I mean, so tons of things. I, I think I probably have, like, 10 or 20 things I'm researching at any given time. <laughs> but one, one of the things that I am, um, I'm learning about and finding very enlivening is um, my own and other people's limiting beliefs around money. Mm -hmm. And how that shows up, uh, not only as individuals, but how that shows up in organizations, how it shows up in the way we're able to talk about um, anything when it gets close to the topic of money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I've, I've been enjoying learning how to facilitate a, an experience for people that helps them, you know, discover that for themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I have a lot of discoveries for myself still to go yet, too. And it's already been a big load of discoveries. Yeah. What's your pro process for research? Like, how do you, do you just uh, read the research or is it a combination of things um, for I have a specific process about like when I, oh, you know, when, when, yeah, when I want to dive into, uh, I have like a little, like I used to create like in, uh, in Trello, like little uh, a car for each thing. And then I would list things and like, just to keep it organized. And I would try to hit it from different angles um, where without, you know, read something, watch a video and uh, try to look at it from as many perspectives as I can um, and kind of make notes, uh, uh, that sounds exactly. super rigorous. Mine is way more <laughs> scattershot sounds. than that. <laughs> I think it my process, my yeah. process for research is to, um, you know, I said I'm motivated by pain, so definitely notice the the places where there's a pain point, yeah. and then ask the question, what would what could address that, and then start researching that thing. But mm -hmm. in general, I pay much more attention to what comes my way than what I think I should go learn. Yeah. Um, and I sort of have a, a general rule that if um, if someone mentions something to me for the third time and I remember that I've heard this two other times, then yeah. I need to go watch that thing or buy that book <laughs> or yeah. whatever. That, so it's coming to me and it could be some very eclectic angle that I'm mm -hmm. not even I don't even have in my mind as part of the main research that I'm doing at that particular yeah. time. The other thing is that, you know, the the rate of content creation has gone up tremendously to it. I cannot mm -hmm. even begin <laughs> to touch into the number of times I say, no, I've never heard of that. And they're like, really? You've never heard of that? <laughs> nope. Yeah. You know, there's just so much. And so um, I think my, my method is really just to be quite broad and intuitive mm -hmm. about what I pay attention to. Yeah. And sometimes I don't know why. Like if two years ago, I got on this email list that's actually curated by an AI bot. And I get in every other day or so, I get an email that says like, here's all the futuristic tech that's going on right yeah. now. And, um, and I didn't really understand why I was so interested in that two years ago. But I opened that frequently. 
Mm -hmm. like, oh, isn't that interesting? They can 3D print houses from dirt now. Wow, <laughs> that's going to change the world. You know, like, so, you know, I see all like these little things that are happening everywhere. And then now I'm doing this um, significant amount of research on um, the rate of exponential, the rate of change being exponential and how the human nervous system isn't necessarily built for that. And then mm -hmm. it turns out that so much of what has been coming my way in that newsletter are ways of helping humans cope and then move toward being able to be in an ex existent existential, ah, exponential and existential <laughs> <laughs> change. Um, so, uh. so I, some, I don't know why sometimes that I am interested in something, but it usually connects at some point. Yeah. So talking about research, uh, I've been listening to different podcasts and like just thinking about, you know, what I want to ask you um, today. And one of the things that I noticed, you bring up your uh, daughter uh, frequently and you talk about how she influences you in very positive ways. Uh, so maybe along the same lines of learning, like what's the biggest thing that you've learned from your daughter and uh, uh, how does she inspire you? You know, I think the biggest thing I learned from her was when, like, when she was maybe two years old or something, and it has yeah. stuck with me, and it actually created, I think, the the space or the trajectory for me to continue learning from her. You know, um, and I think maybe all kids are like this, but she was really like this. I used to call her my little Buddha, yeah. <laughs> because she would be, like, totally in the moment of what she was doing, and I... At that point, when she was about two years old, I made the commitment to myself that I wouldn't teach her the next thing yeah. until I received the lesson she was teaching me in that moment. Mm -hmm. And so I just sort of made it a game with myself. And of course, I didn't actually, you know, do that. I just had the notion I was going to do that. You know, <laughs> parents are constantly teaching, telling, directing, you know, and that happened with me too. It's not like I'm like this enlightened parent or anything, but... Yeah. Um, but I think it did slow down the rate at which I would just throw things at her. Um, and instead, there was more of a two-way street of me noticing what she was doing that was already, you know, something that I needed to bring into my life, a way mm -hmm. I, I needed to improve myself. Yeah. And it's almost like, yeah, I see that I have a five-year-old son. And it's like, I try to, it's so easy to look at things from my perspective, but like the more that I'm trying to understand things from his perspective, uh, the new things that I see or relearn or just, the, you know, a perspective that, you know, maybe I haven't really thought about um, and what's going on through through his head. So um, thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. So let's maybe dive into some of uh, like I wanted to uh, talk about agile coaching and leadership. So uh, what do you think are the biggest shortcomings and issues agile coaches uh, consultants, scrum masters face today in organizations? I think in probably most organizations, the bottleneck has shifted to the way leaders lead. Mm -hmm. I mean, the bottleneck was legitimately delivery teams when we first yeah. brought Scrum, XP, Kanban into the workplace. I mean, it legitimately was. And not necessarily any fault of the delivery teams themselves, but just the whole way the whole thing was organized, right? Mm -hmm. So that bottleneck largely got cleared, you know, and then we encountered a bunch of organizational impediments and uh, bringing in our smart, lean thinking and all that sort of thing started to alleviate many of those. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think now we're to the place that I see from my bird's eye view of, you know, working with so many Agile coaches all around the world. I actually haven't worked in that many individual Agile transformations because my purview has been more like the industry level. So, but, but by hearing their stories and watching the patterns and the leadership teams I have had my own experience with, the bottleneck that I see is just a, an absolute mismatch between the what's been set up in the organization that is moving mm -hmm. toward a more responsive, more transparent, more adaptive, kind of way of working in the world, which matches the world, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the inability to see uh, that the leaders seeing themselves, that the way they're thinking needs mm -hmm. to shift in order to allow these modern ways of working to flourish in their organization. Mm -hmm. Could you and maybe so talk a little bit more about that shift? Um and what does it mean? Because we just had a, a 
uh, uh, the integral um, uh, approaches conference where I had Bill Joyner, I had a bunch of other people. Oh, awesome. Um, uh, and talking about that cognitive development, I'm assuming you're talking about shift, in, cognitive shift or mm -hmm. vertical development shift. Uh, yeah. Could you maybe elaborate on that, what you mean by that and why that is key, why that is the bottleneck? Yeah, yeah. And so um, what I'm talking about is, um, is the ability to increase one's own mental complexity. Mm -hmm the ability to see more of what's actually happening, the ability to stay suspended in uncertainty and um, conflicting perspectives longer before moving. Mm. It's a very uncomfortable place for most humans to be. And so Bill Joyner's work on leadership agility, there's a, there's a stage development model in there. Bill Torbert's stage de development model of action logics. Mm -hmm. We have spiral dynamics, which are values, memes, also a stage development model of human beings. And then we have Robert Kagan's socialized mind, self-authoring mind, self-transforming mind. So these are all saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. They're slightly, you know, and there are a few others that are, Terry O'Fallon has one, there's a few other models. They're all essentially saying the same thing. They just might be saying in Fahrenheit versus centigrade. Right? Exactly. So they don't they don't completely match up, um, but the I think the bottom line of it is that I am realizing, um, and as I'm getting more skill in working with people's trauma, mm -hmm. is that is that in so many conversations, especially at the leadership level, we have people's nervous systems completely activated. And their mm -hmm. executive functions are compromised, and they are making multi-million-dollar, you know, huge decisions, organizational yeah. decisions from that place, mm -hmm. you know, and from a place of a very compromised conversation, in which people are not saying what they really think, mm -hmm. and so you're not getting the benefit um, or of the different opinions, and so, you know, it it really it, it sort of comes down to the same thing that I'm that I used to always talk about with delivery teams, only the impact of what these folks are doing is so much greater. Mm -hmm. you know, and it comes down to, the, I think about the five core competencies, five CCs for short, so I can remember them. <laughs> Communication, conflict, change, um, choice making, and forgetting it's collaboration. Yeah. That makes sense, right? Collaboration. Mm -hmm. So like those are the core competencies I'm always paying attention to on a leadership team. Like how healthy are those core competencies? And on most leadership teams, they're not really healthy. Yeah. You know, most Why do you teams, think that is? is? Is it, can you, like, in, have you identified some of the things or patterns that's uh, impeding those? Yeah. So there are a lot, the patterns are numerous that yeah. show up on leadership teams but it, it what i notice and maybe this is just because this is my bias as well this is sort of how i see the world what i notice is that um we're not very facile in relationship systems skills yet mm -hmm. you know we're just not very good at being in relationship with each other yet we're very good at sort of being functional together okay mm -hmm. but we're not necessarily good when the stakes are high when it's incredibly uncertain when the way forward is unclear and when we are sitting in a tremendous amount of uncertainty you know that's that's the place where people sort of downshift their adult development into whatever is their um, more comfortable level mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately that's just not a match for the complexity of the situations that these leadership teams are sitting in yeah. So the, is it like a muscle, like, you know, in a sense, like if we go back to La Luz, it's like, you know, downgrading from green to orange or amber, or instead of staying green and trying to uh, <laughs> operate from a teal operating system, whatever it is, but it's like uh, the way that you describe it resonates with me because it's, it's like, uh, if we're under pressure and like we're uh, asked to think more systemically, more holistically, and instead of doing that, we almost like kind of cave in to something that's more comfortable rather than embracing that mess and trying to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. Is that is that what it is or? Yeah, and I think that the place I'm anchoring in right now is like how right. that shows up in someone's body. Because yeah. that is the first place that we can have people turn their attention to mm -hmm. realize when they've downgraded their mental complexity, mm -hmm. right? And, and 
And the more we can work with our own triggers, the more we can notice when we're triggered and shift to a more open and generative state, which is totally possible. These are just skills. This is not, you know, not even hard to do necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, the more we can um, work with the animal of our bodies, mm -hmm. then the more we can um, cannot downshift. The more we can stay in the future that we want. Mm -hmm. And that, that's also, yeah. I also think it's hard because the future that we want is pretty unclear. So if you think about the values memes at Green, which is pluralistic, relationship-driven, and at Teal, which is impact-driven, these mm -hmm. things all sound great, but where are the actual structures to have them be real? You mm -hmm. know, and, and the structures do exist. They absolutely do exist. Plenty of people have been doing experiments, especially from the future of work community, for a, a long time on this. Yeah. Um, and this is, there is a book that I actually have a stake in because I recorded the audio book version of it. It's called Lead Together. And the reason I recorded the audio book version is because it's an incredibly practical book. It's like, mm -hmm. if you want to lead from an impact driven elevation or altitude, then here are the practices. Mm -hmm. And is, is it the practices? It's almost, I was talking to Michael Hammond. Uh, I had him actually on a podcast, on the last podcast, about the interplay between the horizontal development and vertical development, where like you have to put this into practice in order to help yourself see things differently. So there's that uh, interplay between practices like, you know, listening, let's just say, and, uh, you, you know, your uh uh, ability to see things in in more complex way uh, by actually you know having deeper and better understanding of you know listening techniques. Uh, so is that kind of is the book like the, the intent behind the book or the practice in the book to uh, do practices like that in order to help you uh, see things and develop your that shift or make that shift towards uh, that. Yeah, it's both internal practices or skills like that that yeah. you just listed, but it's also external structures. It's like, mm -hmm. how do we allow people to choose their own roles and how yeah. do we allow them to negotiate when the something is missing or dropped yeah. through the cracks and sorts of, you know, how do we create legal agreements that are both mm -hmm. human and rigorous? Yeah. You know, so like very practical stuff on the level of the functions that a business mm -hmm. needs to do. So not just the internal development work. Yeah. Um, so it's I, more almost like the the like when you uh, uh, when you look at you know some of the stuff that you've done with Michael Spade around the the integral and like it's mostly the right side, the practices and the systems or mm -hmm. down the we changing that uh, you know part that's more visible, that's more. Uh, um, so like policies and, and structures, governance, uh, all of that. Um, is that is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, the Lead Together book is definitely more on the right side of the practices, roles, yeah. behaviors, and systems, definitely. Mm -hmm. It relies on us already um, having the desire, at least, uh, to live from the pluralistic, relationship-driven, you know, impact driven, wisdom beyond rationality kind of way. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's heavy on the right hand side to, to create some, some momentum or, or do itness mm -hmm. from the left hand side, left hand side being the I and the weak quadrants. And so, like, I often think about this as an infinity symbol mm -hmm. because people always ask the question, like, well, what's first or what's best, <laughs> being or doing? <laughs> And I'm like, both, right? You know, so like, because the because the thing about being is that when we go and we get a new way of thinking and we get a new belief system, it's mm -hmm. amazing, but it's super abstract. And then how do we make it real? We make it real with the doing. We make it real with practices. We make so, it real yeah. with structures. And then that becomes too calcified. It becomes too, rigor too rigid. And then we have to go back into the doing, like to get another mm -hmm. layer deeper in the, in the being, excuse me, and then back to the doing. So... People are like, well, which one's first? I'm like, I don't know. Which one do you have too much of right now? <laughs> yeah. You know, whichever one you have too much of right now might be useful to go to the other side and pick up that next layer down, that next layer of depth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, 
if you were gonna, I know you, uh, uh, this question has been asked uh, before about the book or your book about uh, coaching agile teams. Um, Michael Spade wrote a book, which I think is a, is a good uh, a description of what coaches and consultants um, in an agile community should, should read and be familiar with the stuff that we're talking about here. Uh, Michael Hammond, and there's other people that have been uh, writing about this stuff. Um, from your perspective, if you were going to write a, a, a new book for agile coaches, uh, how important would it be to include um, some of the stuff that my, you know, both Michaels have included in their books? And like, what perspective would you take um, like on that? Like, I'm thinking like from a, from a coaching perspective, what should I, what, you know, for, what would be your suggestion to me? What should I be learning as an agile coach working in an organization or a consultant? Um, well, I think it's important to say that both Michael Spade and Michael Hammond have been close in collaborators with me for many, <laughs> many years. Uh -huh. We are dear friends and workmates and uh -huh. um, often talk about these ideas together. Uh -huh. um, and so just know that I'm coming from that bias. And, mm -hmm. and I think that, uh, that what they're offering is where we need to be headed right now. Because uh, as we move further up in an organization, the amount of complexity increases dramatically and the challenge increases dramatically. And if we, and, and if we as Agile coaches stay with our uh, native perspective and stay with the tools that go with that native perspective, we may very well be coming to organizations and, um, and maybe appropriately trying to apply what we know, but not realizing that there are so yeah. many other options and that the point of leverage is actually not from our native perspective or our tools that we're used to using. The point of leverage is somewhere entirely different. Mm -hmm. And so I think if we're going to have high leverage as agile coaches, if we're not going to waste our time, if we're actually going to help people create a sustainable change inside themselves and in the structures they create in their organizations, that mm -hmm. we have to actually expand our mental complexity first. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that they're spot on. I wouldn't necessarily direct anyone in the agile space to a different thing at this, at this mm -hmm. moment. Are you surprised? Like at least, uh, and maybe this is <laughs> a leading question, um, but uh, let me maybe share my thoughts. I, I was surprised to, like you know, uh, I thought the ideas and in both books, and it, it, it's something that we all as coaches, consultants, should be kind of diving and dissecting and trying to understand. And I still think this is like in the fringes, like there's still like a small group of people that are actually understanding and diving into this stuff. Uh, are you surprised by that? Or do you see it the same way? Um, no, I'm not surprised. Yeah. Because if you look at, um, if you look at the, uh, the values meme or the, or the level of adult development in most agile coaches, we're still at a socialized mind level of development, which, which essentially means mm -hmm. that we go along with uh, what we think the experts have told us we mm -hmm. should do, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's, that, I mean, that's why we don't move very quickly. Um, because, you know, in, in the developed world, the big shift is socialized mind into self-authoring mind. Self-authoring mind, you know, you get to really put the compass of what is good and right and truth and beauty inside of yourself, you know, exactly. and, and no matter what happens, you have that sort of groundedness inside of yourself that you, that you know you are worthy, you know you are good, and, and you're operating from a place of choice. Mm -hmm. And that's the, you know, self-authoring mind is really the first level of adult development where people are operating from a place of conscious choice all the time, mm -hmm. most of the time, you know. Like, well, <laughs> well yeah, you can downgrade, let's, yeah. But... <laughs> let's not pretend that we're saying right? So, yeah. so, the, um, so the, the shift is to continue to help people who are willing and who are mm -hmm. open and who are realizing that socialized mind is no longer serving them is to help them continue to make that shift as easy as possible from socialized mind to self-authoring mind. Yeah. 
in what ways can we help people make that? You know, we talk about, okay, you got to change your perspective. You got to think differently. You know, it's easy to point fingers and say, you don't see it the way that I see it or whatever it is, right? But uh, what have you seen? What's the, what's one of the most effective ways to to get people to to make that shift? Uh, You know, maybe it's some of those practices that you mentioned in the book, but is there anything else, I guess, that, for listeners uh, that you would suggest for kind of for that shift in consciousness? Yeah, I think I think it's to help people really take a good hard look at their own lives mm-hmm. and to help them see does does the challenge that their life is asking of them meet the strategies they have for coping with life mm-hmm. or is the challenge greater? You know, because there's no reason that someone needs to develop as an adult unless they need to, (laughs) you know, I I mean, I I think it's really like a really violent thing to do to come into an organization and go like, yeah, all all you people who are rules and roles and procedure driven, like, you know, Uh that's so that's so last century. No, it's not. We have plenty of people. <laughs> it's <laughs> almost <of> like <laughs> uh, 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 it's almost like you know people running uh, old operating systems on their computers. It's like, well, if it works, for you, if it meets the purpose, and you don't need to upgrade, like you know, you don't have to. But if if your environment, if you need to print something a new printer, and you don't have an up, uh, you know, a driver, <laughs> whatever it is, you, you you need to do something in order to to be able to deal with whatever you need to do. So it's kind of like that, right? Yeah, it's exactly like that. Exactly like that. So I would, you know, I, I my particular um, bias in the world, like the way that I see the world, my little toolbox comes from the I quadrant, which is all about working with individuals and helping them shift their mindsets, helping them increase their mental complexity. So of course, I think about, you know, <laughs> you know, how could we work with individuals and help them, you know, confront the places in their own lives where the way they've been working just ain't working. You know, but there are other ways to approach it. That's just the way that I think about it. Yeah, that also reminds me of uh, 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 Keegan's in over our heads, kind of like it's just uh, uh, we're, we're, <laughs> our mental capacity or complexity is not just uh, keeping up with the constant uh, acceleration, acceleration of change. Um, this was fun. This is uh, an hour. Uh, we've been talking. I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, uh, in closing, what would you like to leave us with? A message or takeaway or anything that you would like to finish with? I think I'd like to encourage us to keep going because Agile um, and all of these modern ways of working, um, they are a multi decade, maybe a hundred year change. Maybe it's going to take that long to really shift into the ability to respond to our environment versus trying to control it. And so I want to encourage us that we're doing the good work and we need to just keep going.